I want to move now to talking about some of the things to think about in um, outlining your participant characteristics. I will talk about entry criteria, contextual factors, access, adherence, and recruitment and retention. So let's start off with entry criteria. When you are starting a study, before you start a study, you want to establish what your criteria are for entry. And you're going to establish both your inclusionary criteria as well as your exclusionary criteria. And by the way, you also, I have a note here, that you want to identify what the target of the intervention is. Most of the time it's going to be an individual patient or participant in your study. But sometimes it could be a dyad or a family. Sometimes it can be a, a provider or a healthcare delivery system. It's important to identify that straight up. So let's talk about entry criteria. Interestingly, the main purpose of inclusionary criteria is different than the main purpose of exclusionary criteria. Okay, So with inclusionary criteria, the main purpose is trying to identify the participants who are going to be most relevant to the outcomes of your study. That's the main purpose. You also need um, to, to think about inclusionary criteria because you need to report on it. You need to report in your consort statement what your inclusionary and exclusionary, your both inclusionary and exclusionary criteria, and you need to be able to identify individuals that you've, uh, that you've identified um, that are fitting your inclusionary criteria. And then you need to balance between participant variability. So what do I mean by balancing between participant variance. So your participants are going to be, have lots of different characteristics. And when you include participants, uh, when you set out what your inclusionary criteria are, what you need to think about is, again, how tightly controlled you want those inclusionary criteria to be or how loose you want them to be. So if you say your inclusionary criteria are uh, anyone between the ages of 18 and 70. That's a, that's a wide, wide open criteria. And that's fine, but it's going to have lots and lots of variability in it. For some studies, that's going to be appropriate, but for many studies it won't be appropriate. The variance will be too wide. So one of the examples I give here is that let's say you're doing a study of migraine, you have a new treatment for migraine, um, so you have to set out inclusionary criteria. So maybe you'll say, um, I'm going to identify the uh, type of migraines. I'm going to identify the uh, duration that the migraines, uh, the migraines in any individual participant occur for and the frequency of those attacks. And um, I'm going to specify what other medications participants can use when they're enrolled in the study. Those are inclusionary criteria. Those you report out on, and those are going to target for this question specific um, characteristics that are relevant. Now contrast that with exclusionary criteria. The main purpose of exclusionary criteria is to establish safety, to, um, uh, to uh, control confounding factors, and for feasibility. So when you set out the criteria by which you are not going to allow someone to participate in the study, the most important reason to not allow someone to be in your study is for safety reason. If the study is going to be too high risk for that particular uh, characteristic of a participant, you don't want them in your study. It's going to be too risky. If, uh, if you're not sure about the safety issue, you may, use, you may use some of the criteria as exclusionary criteria. There may be things that, um, that participant characteristics that participants bring with them that might confound your findings. Uh, let's say you're tra trying uh, to test a new drug and um, you uh, want to make sure that um, the effects of that drug are clear, you may not want to allow other medications to be used because they could confound the effects that you're looking at for your intervention. 
and then feasibility, which we've talked about before. So the example I give here is, let's say you're testing a new medication for high blood pressure, and you may want to exclude people with heart failure for safety reasons. People with heart failure are um, complex and difficult to, to treat, and so we may not want to include them in a trial of a new medication. Um, you may exclude people with diabetes. Diabetes and high blood pressure are often comorbid, but there may be some confounding factors. So you may decide to exclude those participants. And feasibility issues, if you have to do lots of testing, you may not want to include um, individuals who are bedridden, for example, because it wouldn't be feasible for them to come to the clinic frequently for testing. So, the, different, the reason for excluding participants is very different than the reason for including participants. Now, one of the questions I get all the time is, when do I establish what the inclusionary and exclusionary criteria are? And the answer is very, very early. You want to establish this before you start your study, obviously. You need to establish it before you go to your IRB for approval. You need to establish it before you get funding because it's going to be so critical to the success of your study. So you do it very, very early on. The reason these criteria are so important is because this is a, an easy way for unintentional bias to creep into your study design. If you're not clear and I mean crystal clear, what your inclusionary and exclusionary criteria are, not only for you as a PI, but also for any staff that you have who are going to be recruiting participants. If you don't have crystal clear inclusionary and exclusionary criteria, it's possible that you may end up with a bias sample. You may, your own bias in, uh, in wanting to enroll a particular participant into your study may creep in unless you have really clear reasons to include them or exclude them. So I encourage you to do this early, to be very, very specific, to write it all down, and to make sure that everyone on your staff understands what these criteria are. So the next question that I always get is, well, can I change them? Now, why do people want to change their uh, entry criteria? The, the most difficult part of doing a clinical trial is what? Recruitment. Everyone knows that. So um, if you start a trial, you have uh, entry criteria that's clearly laid out. You can't enroll adequately. You're not meeting your milestones. One of the things that people want to do is change their entry criteria. You can do that but it, you pay a price. Um, so, so the price you pay is the price that you may actually allow some of that bias to creep in. So if you are going to go, if you're going to go down this road and change your entry criteria, you want to make sure that you do it in as unbiased a way as possible. You don't change your entry criteria when you're sitting across from someone who you really want to enroll in your study. They're really perfect. There's one little inclusionary criteria they don't quite meet, but they're close, and you really need to meet your milestone this month. That's not the time and the, and the way that you change your entry criteria. If you need to change it, you go to your DSMB, you go to your IRB, you do it in as unbiased a way as possible, and you do it extremely infrequently. So if you're going to do it because of recruitment issues, do it once. Don't keep coming back to it. Again, because you do not want to bias your sample. Context. There are lots of contextual factors, and um, I'm not going to go through all the contextual factors that um, that are potentially um, factors to think about when you're thinking about who to include in your studies. But context is really important, and you know, just like Jerry was saying earlier, when you're when you are a researcher and you are engaging with a participant in your study, you have a relation. That is a relationship. And that relationship has context. And not only that, participants who come into your study have a whole world of context, almost none of which you're aware of, some of which you may be aware of, but almost none of which you're aware of. 
So by context, what I mean are things like personal experiences, background, culture, their social environment, uh, how, how a participant feels on that particular day, the relationship that you as an experimenter or researcher have. All of these are contextual factors, and they make a difference. And I'm going to prove to you that they make a difference. Um, I've got a couple of studies to show you. So um, these are the findings from a study uh, called SWAN, which is um, a study, it's a longitudinal study, it's not a trial, it's a longitudinal study of middle-aged women. And um, the, the purpose of SWAN was, uh, was to look at women longitudinally as they go through, as they age, um, and to look at a variety of health outcomes. Um, one of the outcomes that they were particularly interested in was metabolic syndrome, incident metabolic syndrome. Um, but they took a lot of measures, as often we all do as researchers. We take a lot of measures. And one of the measures that they happened to take were some measures on early childhood trauma. And um, the SWAN investigators had some measures of metabolic syndrome at two different time points. And when they looked to see how metabolic syndrome was progressing in this large cohort of women, somebody had the very clever idea to look at the progression of metabolic syndrome in relationship to early childhood physical abuse. Now, there is a literature that suggests that that might be something interesting to look at. And what they found was that the the percentage of women who actually were more likely to develop metabolic syndrome was much, much higher, twice as high, in women that had experienced early childhood uh, physical abuse. The experience of having early childhood trauma is a contextual factor. And I'm not suggesting that you go out, no matter what your question is, and ask everyone about early childhood trauma, but I am suggesting that you look at the literature carefully in terms of these contextual factors and think carefully about what measures you need to be taking in addition to your primary outcomes, because context is important. And I have another example in case this didn't sway you. And this is a finding that people know about. It's, it's a very familiar finding, um, but it's interesting to, to, to point out. Um, this is um, a, a study looking at um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. They were looking at cardiac events. Again, disclaimer, I'm from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, so that's what I talk about. Um, and what they looked at was um, they followed up individuals uh, who, um, who were hypertensive and taking hypertensive medication. And they followed up to find out um, what, the, uh, what the survival was in these, uh, in these patients. And what they found was that, um, I didn't show you the first curve, which was, which was something like a curve in between here. What they found, though, was that if you separated out patients that took at least one of their blood pressure medications before bed, from those who took all of their blood pressure medications in the morning, you find very different survival curves. And as I say, it's better to take it, it's better to take it right before you go to bed, by the way. And as I say, this is a, this is a familiar finding to us now. We know that the timing of medication is important. And for blood pressure medication, it's important to take uh, at least one of your medications at night. But what I'd suggest to you is that the time at which a participant takes medication is a contextual factor. So again, you wouldn't know that unless you read the literature, this, and it is a big literature now, an increasing literature, but it's contextual. So context is important. That doesn't mean that you need to measure everything because you can't, but you need to think about context when you are thinking about your participant characteristics and your outcomes. So access is another feasibility issue, right? Can you access the particular 
uh, participants with the particular characteristics that you're looking for. And you need to think about this early because, you, again, you can have a fantastic study. It could be the best science in the world. But if you can't get participants into your study because they don't live in your geographic area or they don't come to your clinic or you, uh, you, know, you in, other, in any other way don't have access, then you can't carry out the study. And one way of increasing access to the participants that you would like to study is to build an interdisciplinary team. Now, there are lots of good reasons to build an interdisciplinary team. One of them is that it helps enhance access to participants that you might not have access to, but someone on your team may have access to. And of course, when you, as you build this interdisciplinary team and as you have um, uh, you know, access issues, you may need to have many sites in your, in your trial, um, and that's okay. Um, it, it has its, you know, downsides, but that's okay. But again, thinking about these in the context of the patient characteristics that you are identifying. I'd like to make a plea to not uh, include your own patients or your own practice in your research. Uh, separation helps you maintain equipoise and deliver good clinical care. We'll talk a little bit about recruitment and retention because it's such a, a critical issue in running a, a, a trial. Um, and, I, you know, I actually do a whole uh, couple of lectures on recruitment and tension because it is so important and because it's complex. It, it doesn't seem that way and we all start our, our trials saying, okay, we're just gonna recruit people and they're gonna stay because they love us, but, it, but it's hard. It's really hard work. And so um, it's good to think about it at all phases of, of your trial. Um, most of the, of the trials that uh, don't complete, and a failed trial is a trial that doesn't complete. Most failed trials don't complete because, um, because of recruitment issues. Sometimes retention, but mostly because of recruitment. So what do you need to think about in terms of both recruitment and retention? And probably the number one thing to think about is the burden that you in your protocol are putting on the participants, the participants that you are selecting to be in your study. And that burden um, is part of your, the assessments that you do, the measurements that you do, um, as well as the complexity and the duration of the treatment. So if you're planning a, a, a five-year trial that requires four years of follow-up from your participants, that's a heavy burden. Um, if you're requiring participants to come into your clinic every day for a couple of weeks, that's a heavy burden. And the higher that burden, the more difficult it's going to be to get participants into your study, no matter who they are, and to retain them in your study. And it's going to be even more important depending on the characteristics of your participants. Those characteristics are things like how healthy your participants are or how sick they are, what other needs they have. Um, and remember that those needs extend beyond their own personal needs to their family needs as well. So if you want to do a study of you know, uh, childbearing women, healthy childbearing women, for example, um, it's great to, to uh, to uh, identify that population for study, but they may have childbearing issues, so you may need to provide childcare for them. Um, other participants may have um, other kinds of logistics issues like uh, transportation issues. Um, everyone has parking issues because it's almost always difficult to park. So those kinds of things are things that you want to think about and try to uh, do something about to reduce the burden. Um, I have here uh, this notion that uh, intention to treat is the analysis that you will do. And intent to treat analysis uh, means that you will analyze everyone that you randomize into your trial. You will all do intent to treat analyses. And that means that as soon as you randomize someone into your trial, they're yours. They are yours. That means that you will carry them throughout the duration of the trial. They may not give you any more data beyond the first visit, but you must include them in your analysis, in your primary analysis. And what that means, you'll talk about this in your analytics section later, but what that means is that you want to be really careful about who you randomize into your, into your study. 
So I know that a lot of you have had experience in trying to enhance recruitment, and, and you do a lot of things. We'll talk about what some of, what some of those things might be. And um, what you want is to encourage people to to uh, sign up for your for your trial, right? That's what that's what you try to do when you make these active and really intense recruitment efforts, and that's a good idea. But I would suggest to you that when you are doing your recruitment efforts, what you actually do is make it hard. Make it hard for participants to sign up for your study. And the reason for that, the reason I say that, and I don't mean make it feasible, you know, make it hard in a feasible sense, but I think you want to be really, really brutally honest with participants in terms of what it will take to be in your trial what they will have to do. You know, I, um, I, I recommend that if you have a, uh, a, a, a group recruitment effort, that is you hire a room like this, you know, you have a room like this and you have a whole bunch of people come to listen to your, to your pitch about being in the study, you have discussions about what the downsides of being in your study is. Have the discussions outright because I can guarantee you that participants are going through those things in their heads, so you might as well get it out on the table. And by doing that, you may get a few fewer people to, rec to actually enroll in your study or say that they're interested in enrolling in your study, but you will get people who are more likely to be retained in your study. And it is more important to get people to be retained in the study than to get a lot of people who are enrolled and then drop out. That hurts your power, it hurt, hurts your ability to make causal inferences. It's much more important to retain participants. So as you're doing your recruitment efforts with all of the criteria that you've, uh, that you've laid out in terms of who you want to enroll and who, who you need to exclude, um, be really critically uh, honest about what it's going to take for participants to be in your, uh, in your trial. So oftentimes people want to know, you know, I've tried everything. What more can I do? So I want to walk through just a few things. We're a little bit, it's related to what we're talking about, but, it, but it, it's important, I think. So what are some of the things that you can do to enhance recruitment? And one of them is to use this layered approach, which is, you know, another way of saying a multi-pronged approach. Do not rely on one approach for your recruitment efforts because one, one approach is probably not going to do it for you. So um, if your IRB will allow it, use social media. It's very effective. You need to go through your IRB, though, to make sure it's allowable. If it's not, you can use community-based kinds of um, strategies. And even though you wouldn't go through social marketing strategies, you may have community-based um, outreach programs that you can piggyback onto. The old-fashioned way is to do targeted distributions of mailings. Um, it's old-fashioned, but it works. Uh, you get about 1%. And that's okay because it's pretty cheap, but um, it, it is an effective strategy. But you have to have a lot of people available to send out your mailings to in order for it to work for your particular study. Um, a lot of people do presentations at health fairs or community settings. That's a great idea. I encourage you to do it. None of these are going to give you, you know, half of your sample. They're all going to be it's this layered approach that you take. One thing that I don't see as frequently, but I really recommend it to you, is to pair up with one or two others who are doing research in a different area, but maybe have sort of similar criteria, entry criteria that you do, but different exclusionary criteria. Because what might happen, and I've seen this uh, done very successfully, what can happen is that um, somebody who is not eligible for your study may be eligible for the study next door and vice versa. And if you can partner with other researchers, and you must do this with permission of your uh, potential participants, it can be a very effective way because you have somebody who's already interested in research. You know, they already want to contribute. And so once you have that person, e even if they're not eligible for your study, they may, may be eligible for another study. So think about that referral process. Set your milestone goals reasonably. That is your recruitment milestones. Make sure that you are being realistic. 
Um, and then in some cases, you can employ a run-in strategy. And this, this is not universally um, applicable for all studies. You have to think about whether it is appropriate for your study. But a run-in strategy is when you have potential participants before you randomize them. You consent them, but before you randomize them, you have them do something. And you have them do something similar to what they would do in the study, but it's something that both arms would do or all three arms, however many arms you have. So if you have people that you want to record in a diary every day, send them home for two weeks and ask them to record whatever you want them to record in a diary. And um, that run-in period can help you identify who will be adherent and who will not be adherent. It's a much more self-selected population that you end up with if you go through this strategy. So if you're looking to do something on the uh, on the um, uh, effectiveness end of the spectrum, it may not be the right strategy. But if you're looking to do something on the efficacy end of the spectrum, it may work for you. And of course, you always want to employ strategies to make sure that you have a representative uh, sample. Retention is as important, maybe more important than recruitment. You, if you can get people into your study but you can't keep them there, that's a problem. So uh, how do you improve retention? And there are, there are lots of things you can do. Probably the most important is to think about burden and think about how you can reduce burden. The other thing to think about is, and, and it, it, by reducing burden what I mean is shorten your study duration, shorten the amount of questionnaires people have to fill out, shorten the number of visits they have to do, or make it easier for them to do those things. Provide vouchers, um, go to their home sometimes, go to a more central location. There are lots of things that you can do depending on your particular study. Um, but make your intervention as, uh, as simple as you can. Complex interventions are a reason that participants do not adhere and eventually why they drop out. If you can optimize the visits, you know they're coming to the CRC for a medical visit, make sure that's also a study visit as well. That helps. Reducing barriers, we've talked about that. Um, providing incentives. Incentives don't have to be costly, but they do have to be kind of meaningful. So a refrigerator magnet pencil, maybe not, but something that really means something. Um, to participants. If you're getting participants a medication that, um, for example, really increases dry mouth, that, that's, a, that's a burden for participants. Nobody likes that. So maybe you give them a water bottle that has your logo on it. That's a meaningful incentive because it tells participants that you understand what some of these side effects are and that you're trying to, to help them out. Um, Make your, uh, make your visits, uh, set up your visits early in the process. If you set each visit um, at a time when you have a current visit, then you, so what am I trying to say? Set up the follow-up visits early on and set them all up at the same time so that participants know what they're getting into and they know when they're going to come back. If you do that, they're more likely to, um, to be able to make those visits. So adherence. The only thing I really have to say of adherence is you need to measure it, and it's a hard thing to measure. You need to, as much as you can, enhance it. And by adherence, I mean participant adherence, obviously, but also provider adherence. So whoever is delivering your intervention, you want that person to be as adherent as possible as well. And we talked about um, using a, a run-in uh, phase in order to um, increase adherence. And this is an example um, that many people actually use. If you're doing a study of obstructive sleep apnea, then the, the, the treatment of choice for most patients with obstructive sleep apnea is to use CPAP, right? To use um, continuous positive air pressure for them. But it's very, very burdensome because it's the mask that people have to wear. They have to wear it at night. Nobody likes it. Even if you're not running a study, you know, patients who use it don't like it. Um, but some people will do it, and some people absolutely won't do it. So 
how do you know who those people are beforehand? Because if nobody is going to wear the CPAP, then you're not going to be able to find out the answer to your question because that's part of your intervention. So in that case, what you might want to do is have a sham run-in um, where you actually have people wear a CPAP. You don't deliver anything, you know, no positive air, but they wear the mask. And um, people that can't adhere to that likely won't adhere to the intervention. So that's an idea of how you can do these, um, these sham run-ins. There are ways to optimize adherence. I recommend that you get someone on your team who knows how to do this. There isn't a science to uh, adherence. Um, one of the strategies that can be used is called motivational interviewing. It can be used with participants and it can be used with providers. Um, and it is a way to increase uh, engagement of your participants in your study and providers. Um, but you can't learn how to do it from a book. You need to be trained in it. So if you want to employ this strategy, if you have a large trial and want to, that's burdensome, and want to employ this strategy, it's a good idea to think about finding somebody who can do it. This orientation session is something that I was alluding to before, when you have a group of people and you're kind of telling them about the study to see if they want to participate. This is before you actually enroll anyone before you randomize anyone. You're just kind of laying out your case for why um, they may want to participate. Um, this is a great opportunity for you to provide um, information um, and to develop this relationship with potential participants. I, I really like for, it's not appropriate for all studies, but if it is appropriate for your study, I really think this is a fantastic strategy. It enables you to answer questions. It enables you to get fairly adherent people because I've already come to an orientation session, people who are interested in the study, and it enables you to give them the case why they shouldn't enroll, all the reasons why they shouldn't enroll. Of course, you're also going to talk about why they should enroll in the study. Yeah, but, it, but it really gives you an opportunity to get people into your study who may be, um, may, you may be able to retain into the study. Um, contact backups, these are family members. If you can get those from participants, that's a good idea if you're doing a longitudinal study. People move and sometimes they forget to tell you. Um, so it's a good idea to have a backup. Um, and again, you get that from the participants with their consent on the consent form. And then if you can maintain contact, again, with uh, trials that are longitudinal, if you can main co maintain contact with participants, um, one way to do it is to phone them if that's part of your intervention. But, you know, it's really nice to send birthday cards. It doesn't cost very much, and people really appreciate it. Again, it's part of this relationship that you're building. Um, and, and newsletters are also very effective. They take time, but they're very effective. <laughs>